Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Bakus, and I'm one of Dr. Cartwright's research students. I'm happy to be with you today to talk about St. Patrick. Uh, my research focuses on Muraku's life of St. Patrick, um, and it specifically deals with its theological content. I'm working to develop and apply a biblical hermeneutic to the text with the goal of deducing how the seventh century audience would have interpreted and applied the text and how they would have used it in their spiritual development. However, one essential part of this study is to understand what scholars know about the historical Patrick and how it relates then to the hagiographical text. So there are um, multiple facets to what I'm studying and part of understanding Muraku and where he's coming from is to understand what we know about the historical Patrick. Um, part of what Muraku does is use Patrick's own writings to inform his writing. And so it's, it was an essential part of my study to understand what we know of Patrick and uh, what Patrick actually wrote and what he left us. But what's interesting is we know actually very little in the way of the historical Patrick. And what is mainly known comes from his own hand. At some point in his ministry, he pens his letters to the soldiers of Caroticus, which directly addresses the issue of Christians being sold as slaves in Ireland. He has also left us with his Confessio, which, according to most scholars, was written late in his ministry career as a defense of his ministry Patrick practices, excuse me, and so-called quote, sins of his youth. Scholars cannot agree on the time in which Patrick was active in Ireland. Um, this has caused a lot of scholarship, a lot of ink to be spelled on when, when was Patrick actually ministering in Ireland. There are educated guesses, and those guesses are all based on the historical record that's available to us. However, with contradictory obits for Patrick, this leads to confusing, but sometimes in extremely inventive theories to date Patrick's ministry activity. This, as James Carney deems it, quote, problem of St. Patrick, end quote, is not a new problem. Even as early as the seventh century, there were contradictory accounts of Patrick as acknowledged by Muraku. He states in his prologue, quote, the conflicting opinions and many doubts both voiced by many a person have prevented them from ever arriving at one undisputed sequence of events, end quote. There are, however, generally accepted theories of dating Patrick's ministry activity. We will look at three of these theories and one which is a modified theory. Um, so the first one that we're going to look at is the early date of St. Patrick. Now, modern scholars do not widely accept this first theory, but it is worth noting. The theory states that Patrick's mission in Ireland was much earlier than has been previously thought, putting him in the late fourth century and into the fifth. Mario Esposito argues that Patrick ministered from around 350 to 430. In doing so, he admittedly disregards all the chronological data that exists. He states, quote, we shall envision this problem as purely one of common sense, end quote. He goes on to suppose that Ireland was largely converted much earlier than supposed, which is why the Pope sends Palladius in 431. He states, quote, to organize and administer the affairs of the Christians, end quote. He argues that Patrick does not mention a predecessor in his writings. Therefore, the presence of Palladius pre-Patrick could be put into question. However, this is an argument from silence and does not mean that Patrick was unaware of any of his predecessors. The problems with this view are pretty obvious, in, in my opinion. Firstly, as mentioned above, Esposito completely disregards all the tradition that we do possess. It also discounts any validity to the lady, later hagiographical material. Now, hagiography cannot be assumed as history, as Kathleen Hume says. Uh, 
but the biographers of Patrick were dealing with some form of tradition that was handed down to them. There's also the fact that Christianity did not flourish until the fifth century. This would have put a gap between Patrick's mission, uh, that between rather Patrick's coming to Ireland and the actual spread of Christianity on the island. And I think that's, that's a major problem to, the, to this um, idea that Patrick operated in the late fourth century and into the fifth century. The second theory, and this is dubbed by many as the quote, orthodox view, at its essence is, the, is this theory maintains that Patrick arrived in 432, had a ministry period of around 30 years, and then died in 461. It's important to note that all of the source evidence for this theory comes from the 7th century or later. The date of 432 is found in the annals, and find support by scholars such as Bury, McNeil, Ryan, and Beeler. The seventh century lives also support this particular date. Muruku puts Patrick's coming at the heels of Palladius' mission from Rome in 431. Turichan and I apologize for the complete butchering of these names. Um, I don't obviously speak the language, and so I'm, I'm purely guessing on how to actually pronounce these names, uh, but I'm going to just go with Tirichan. Um, he was writing in the 7th century, and he opts for the 432 date as well, believing that Patrick's life spans uh, an exact mosaic age of 120 years. According to James Carney, Tirichan supposed Patrick's pre-ministry life consisted of 59 years, which would have given him 61 years to minister in Ireland, thus putting his arrival at 432 and his death in, death in 493. Between the early date and the late date of Patrick, and this is kind of the modified uh, view, is the view put forth in March of 1942 by O'Rahili, known as the two Patrick theory. His theory was that there were actually two Patricks at work within the fifth century. The first missionary was Palladius Patrick, who arrived in 431 and died in 461 and was commissioned by Pope Celestine. Afterwards, in 461, the Patrick that we know from the Confessio and Epistola arrived in Ireland and had a ministry period of around 30 years and then died in 492. These two Patricks were later merged into one super missionary in the seventh century by the hagiographers. Now, Beeler does um, recognize, he, he does opt for the um, early date of Patrick, but he recognizes that, that, that there possibly was a second Patrick who came in 461 and then died in 492, but that nothing is relatively known of him. Um, so he does opt for the early date, but he also recognizes that there was possibly a second Patrick at work within the fifth century as well. Um, but uh, or, and according to O'Rahilly, these two Patricks of the 5th century were merged into one and that their deeds actually overlap and that they were combined by the hagiographers. Uh, lastly, uh, scholars such as James Carney and Thomas O'Loughlin view Patrick as coming in 461, having a ministry period of around 30 years and dying in 492 or 493. Um, James Carney says, quote, these two dates, 432 and 461, are found in the annals and have, and 432, but not 461, has the general support of the lives, end quote. Because of the competing historical records, Carney argues that the late 7th century fits Patrick's situation and context better than the early dates. Now, one great downfall to Carney's theory is how he relies on the historicity of certain passages from Tirichan and Muruku, yet at the same time deems other passages as purely fictitious. For instance, Carney relies on the historicity of the Tara event and uses it as a base to calculate Patrick's arrival to Ireland. Um, the Tara event is found in Muruku and, and is a very significant event. It's, it's the first Easter on Ireland. However, Muruku relates a story before the first Easter of, of Patrick going north 
to redeem himself from his former slave owner. We'll talk about more of this uh, in the second part of this lecture when we deal specifically with, with Muraku's life of St. Patrick. Um, but it's important uh, to note that Carney deems that previous journey north as, com as completely made up by Muraku, completely for fictitious. Yet at the same time, he views Muraku's Tara event, the, the, the first Easter event on Ireland, as historically accurate. Um, Binchy, who, uh, who argues against, um, against Carney's theory, he states, quote, this capacity to dis distinguish between fact and fable in the seventh century biographies is a gift which I cannot claim to possess. To me, all their statements are equally suspect, suspect even, when confirmed by Pat even when confirmed by Patrick's own words or by independent evidence. The fact of the matter is that there is no scholarly consensus on when Patrick was active in Ireland. The theories just described are based on historical evidence, but the interpretation and reliance on that evidence varies from scholar to scholar. We might never know for sure when Patrick arrived on his missionary journey that shaped the nation for centuries to come. I mean, we're still celebrating St. Patrick even today. Now, mind it, we're doing it in some pretty interesting ways, but the fact of the matter is that we're still celebrating St. Patrick, not just in Ireland, but around the world. However, we can know for certain that he operated within the confines of the fifth century. We can, based on Patrick's own writings, find common ground that scholars agree upon. David Dumville identifies two strands of evidence which, quote, together define an approximate period within which Patrick must have worked. So what are those two strands of evidence? We're gonna talk about those right now. The first example he gives, the first strand of evidence, is from Patrick's letter to the soldiers of Caroticus. Patrick writes, quote, this is the custom of the Roman Christians in Gaul. They send holy and able men to the Franks and other heathen with so many thousand solidi to baptize, uh, to ransom baptized captives, end quote. And that the, the key word there is heathen. Dumville observes, quote, if the Franks were heathen in Patrick's time, that was an unlike that was unlikely to be in the sixth century, for Clovis was the first Frankish king to be converted, end quote. Clovis, it is well documented, was baptized in 496. Now, it might be possible that Patrick is unaware of the new situation in Gaul. It is difficult to determine how fast news of such kind could reach Patrick's ears. It is also entirely possible that the captivity of Christians might not have ceased simply because the king became a Christian. We cannot assume that all, all of the people within Clovis's kingdom became Christians simply because the king was converted, nor that all previous practices ceased. However, it does seem unlikely that Patrick would have referred Gaul as a heathen territory within the context of the sixth century. So if basically if, if Patrick is writing in the sixth century, it is unlikely that he would have um, referred to the Franks as heathen because of the baptism of Clovis. The second strand of, of, of evidence, so that, that's kind of one one barrier that we're up against is the the, the sixth century. Um, the second one puts them uh, the puts the fourth century as too early for Patrick, um, and this is based on Beeler's analysis of Patrick's biblical citations. According to Beeler, Patrick knew one first of all, a holy Latin text of all the Old Testament, save for the Psalter, and the New Testament of Revelation. Secondly, he knew a Vulgate text of Acts. And thirdly, his citation of the Psalter and of the New Testament is contaminated. Essentially, we have some pre-Vulgates 
but with some Vulgate reading. So, so the idea is that Patrick's um, use of the Bible is both pre-Vulgate and Vulgate, and that these two things were merged in Patrick's writings. So what do we know about the Vulgate? We know that Jerome's Vulgate New Testament was completed in 383. The Old Testament, however, wasn't completed until 404. So if Patrick's education happened before his mission, which is entirely reasonable to assume, then it is barely, very unlikely that it would have occurred previous to the fifth century. Jerome was working from Rome and later Palestine. And so it would have taken time for his work to spread. In fact, it wasn't until the year 400 that translation, uh, that his work can be identified as being used in North Africa. So it wasn't until 400 that, that he was being used in North Africa. So who knows how long it would have taken uh, for his writings to reach Britain, but at the very least, Gaul. Um, th there's evidence to suggest that, that Patrick did his training in Gaul, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but if it is indeed Gaul where he studied, it still would have taken time for Jerome's Vulgate to spread that far. Um, so given the fact um, that Patrick refers to the situation in Gaul as, as, the, as a heathen territory, so making the sixth century too late, um, and the use of his biblical citations includes Vulgate and pre-Vulgate words, um, which eliminates the fourth century. That puts him within the fifth century. Therefore, I think the, the early date that we discussed first can be completely dismissed. And as we discussed, there were multiple defici deficiencies to this early date. Um, and it just completely ignores the historical data that we do possess. However, whether he operated within the early part of the fifth century or the later part of the fifth century is a matter of debate. And the fact is, is that we simply cannot go. It's a puzzle. It's an unsolvable puzzle, if you will. We have these contradictory obits, we have this contradictory data, and uh, different scholars piece that data together in different ways. So while these are educated guesses and, and good guesses, they are just that, they're just guesses. Um, but we do, we do know for certain that he did operate sometime within the fifth century. So moving on to the context. What was the context that Patrick was operating in? Where did, what was exactly the ecclesiastical slash historical context in Ireland at the time of Patrick's mission? We do know that there were Christians in Ireland at the time of Patrick. It is widely known and widely documented that nations would take the citizens of neighboring kingdoms into captivity. This happened around the, the edges and around the bounds of many, many kingdoms, virtually all kingdoms of antiquity. We know that the Romans did this. We know that the Egyptians did this. Um, and we know the, the pre-Christian uh, Irish did this as well. Um, and we know this from Patrick's own writings. Patrick himself tells us that he was taken captive, quote, with many thousands others, end quote, to Ireland. And now we will discuss a little bit later in the lecture how this time in captivity formed him and affected the rest of his life. But for now, I want to point out that when other nations would take slaves, the slaves would bring their own religion to their new home. Prosper even comments how Christian slaves could convert their pagan masters. It did happen. He states, quote, some sons of the church who had been captured by enemies had handed, have handed their masters into the possession of Christ's gospel. And by virtue of teaching the faith, 
faith, they have charge of those whom they were serving as slaves taken in war, end quote. So it is entirely possible uh, to the, for the slave trade to bring the ideas of Christianity to Ireland well before Patrick's mission. Therefore, Patrick's mission to Ireland was not one in which he was going to a place where Christianity was completely foreign. However, it is unclear to what extent Christian ideas had spread. Now in 431, Pope Celestine sent Palladius, quote, to the Irish believing in, in Christ. Therefore, word spread that there were enough Christians in Ireland to warrant the Pope to send a bishop. However, it is entirely possible that Palladius's mission could have been fairly local with much of Ireland remaining untouched. We know even less of Palladius's mission than we do of Patrick's. Despite Patrick's continual reference to the Irish as, quote, heathen and pagan, he did not enter a vacuum where the ideas of Christianity were completely foreign. See, it would not have been like the pilgrim setting sail to America to come into contact with the native Americans that were completely foreign to, uh, to Christ and to Christianity. They had no idea that there was even a Europe. Um, they, comp they landed in completely foreign soil. That simply soil, that simply was not the case with Patrick. Ideas would have been, been spread. Um, even outside of the slave trade, Ireland traded both with Britain and the continent. And so we know that there were wine merchant merchants that went from uh, France and from Gaul to Ireland. And so it's possible that even just within commerce, within the, the trade, um, pre, the, the pre-Christians of Ireland would have been exposed to some Christianity and, and some Christian ideas. Now, how much a wine merchant actually evangelized in Ireland could could be thrown into question. We simply don't know if uh, you know if if a wine merchant uh, putting into port someplace in Ireland would have stood up on his boat and preached the gospel. Now that's pretty unlikely, but with trade comes an exchange of ideas, and so the exchange of ideas would have been taking place well before Patrick's mission. So Patrick did not come uh, into a vacuum. Uh, Christianity was at least known. People had heard of Christians before Patrick's mission. So, but, but despite this, it can be noted, going, going back here, that uh, despite there being Christians in Ireland, it was still viewed as a pagan territory. And this is significant in Patrick's own writings and even uh, uh, the ecclesiastical context. They viewed Ireland as, because it was outside the Roman Empire, it was outside of God's kingdom. It wasn't yet God's territory. And that is significant in understanding Patrick's confessio, in understanding Patrick's mission. Ireland was outside the bounds of God's kingdom. It was still viewed as pagan territory, and we'll discuss a little bit later the significance of that and uh, how Patrick views his mission to the Irish. But let's turn to his writings. I mean, to do that, we're going to look at his writings. So we will look at primarily his confess confessio due to the autobiographical information which can be gleaned. Um, because of his firsthand account, we can know quite a bit about who Patrick was, where and how he grew up, what kind of man he desired to be, to be and how he viewed his ministry and mission. The Confessio itself was written from Ireland. In paragraph 37 and 62, Patrick tells his readers that he determined to live out his days in Ireland. He also tells us in paragraph 10 that he is writing, quote, as an old man, end quote late in his ministry career and life. So we know that this was, at whatever date you choose, whether it be the 460s or the 490s, this was late in his ministry career. The occasion for writing is to provide a defense of his life and ministry. 
reason has it that there were certain people who opposed both Patrick's ministry and his, quote, sins of his youth, end quote. What Patrick gives his readers is something more than a simple defense of his ministry. This is, this is key. This is, this is important to understand. It is written to declare God's goodness and work through his ministry. So there are two, two things that Patrick is doing here. He's both giving a defense for his ministry, and he's giving God the glory for what he has done in his ministry. To, he, he writes to tell of God's goodness and, what, and the work of God through his ministry. Thomas O'Loughlin notes, quote, one cannot escape the two strands. Though there are places where we can see that narrating the mighty works of God is the dominant theme, and other places where an apologia for his own style of episcopate is dominant. So there are two, two strands there. The very first paragraph of the Confessio gives the reader a good deal of information about Patrick. He grew up in Britain. His father, Calpornius, was a deacon. His grandfather, Pontius, was a priest. So he was, in effect, a third generation Christian. He states that he was take, taken ca captive at his Uwilula. The fact that Patrick's father was a decurion and his grand, which is both, uh, which is a, a civil uh, position, and his grandfather a priest, along with the fact that Patrick himself was literate, he knew how to read, he knew how to write, shows that his homestead was highly Romanized. It is more than likely that Patrick's home was known as a squatter occupation. Um, Patrick's, uh, in which uh, the squatter occupation was in which uh, a Roman villa was inhabited and reused in late Roman Britain. Dumville argues that this style of squatter occupation, along with being near a small town, po points to West Country as being his most likely point of origin. We don't know exactly where he's from. He makes reference to uh, a, a town. Um, but we don't exactly know where, uh, where he grew up. Um, but Patrick would have been born a free man of middle class within the Roman Empire. And this gives him a sense of identity and camaraderie with other Christians, both in Britain and on the continent. This, this, has, um, this has profound effects on how he views himself within the context of his ministry. Uh, it would have created a distinction between himself and those who were Christians, or at least not yet Christians. He would have been fairly well connected to the social structures of the day, to the offices held by his father, both his civil and ecclesiastical offices, and his grandfather, who was a priest. He would have come from old wealth. Um, possibly this, this old wealth was uh, the reason he was in a villa of sorts. Um, that, that probably was reused and retooled. Um, it, uh, so more than likely, a very wealthy person uh, lived in the villa, and Patrick's family at some point moved in and reused and retooled the old Roman, old Roman villa. Um, we do know that he, his father owned slaves, so he would have come from some form of wealth it is possible that the, the raiders who took him captive at, at 16 years of age saw the growing wealth of his father's estate and therefore made it a prime target, something that they say, ooh, we need to go, we need to, uh, we need to hit that before it comes too prosperous. Um, and so uh, this captivity at the age of 16 was the pivotal moment in his life. It was what shaped his, his, his life forever. Let's just read uh, the paragraph 16 of his Confessio to see what impact this had on him. But then, after his captivity, 
When I arrived in Ireland and was spending every day looking after flocks, I prayed frequently each day and more and more the love of God and the fear of him grew in me and my faith was increased and my spirit quickened so that in a day I prayed up to a hundred times and almost as many in the night. Indeed, I even remained in the wood and on the mountain to pray. And come hail, rain, or snow, I was up before dawn to pray, and I sensed nothing of evil nor any other spiritual laziness in me. I now understand this was so at the time. The spirit was fervent in me. This captivity changed him dramatically. It brought a spiritual awareness of God, which otherwise completely eluded him. This doesn't mean, however, that he was completely ignorant of God. As a third generation Christian, he would have been familiar with the liturgy. He would have known how to pray. He would have known how to fast. He would have known how to give, and, uh, give to the poor. He would possibly have been able to articulate clearly the doctrine of the Trinity and why Pelagius was a heretic. But it was his captivity that defined him spiritually. In his captivity, I would argue that all of his head knowledge, uh, everything that he knew about God, translated to his heart. And he experienced God in his soul and in his heart in a way that he had never done before. It is through trials that many times God reveals himself to us. At this point in history, it would have been common to see bad things happening as God's way of correcting something that is off in a person's life. And Patrick refers to this, refers to the fact that he possibly did something wrong, um, and it's because of this wrong, whether that be the sin of his youth or, or something else, or simply, simply his kind of flippant attitude toward Christianity, um, that, uh, that his captivity was God's way of shaking him out of his place, uh, his place of complacency and into the full life of God. He worked as a shepherd in the fields, uh, one of many, many mosaic references that he makes throughout his work, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. He prayed, as was read, a hundred times a day and almost as many at night. Come hail, rain, or storm, I was up before dawn to pray. Um, now, I have to check out the weather app <laughs> every single morning before I run just to make sure I don't get caught running in the rain. Not so with Patrick. Patrick would pray rain, hail, or snow. It did not matter. His captivity brought a zeal to God, uh, a zeal for God, rather, that would sustain him for the rest of his life. The next part, uh, paragraph 17 through 21, deal with his captivity and his escape. He heard a voice telling him that it was time to set sail for home. It was time to go home. The ship, he describes, was 200 miles away. Now, uh, this wasn't actually 200 miles as the crow flies. He could have wandered for many miles, gone up and down valleys, and walked much further than he would have gone than if he would have gone just in a straight line. Now, some people take this 200 mile reference and a reference to the wood that the wood of Foucault and try to determine where his uh, captivity would have taken place. They determine what ports were his possible point port of departure and try to measure 200 miles from there to a certain wood to determine where Patrick was held in captivity. The problem with that is that there's no, there's simply no way of knowing uh, what this term 200 miles actually would. Irish routes, according to Thomas O'Loughlin, were not marked out as were Roman mar uh, miles. And while the Romans were extremely accurate with their mile markers, Ireland was never under Roman control, wasn't under Roman occupation. So they didn't have those things. Um, and we have to remember that this was written at the end of his life and mathematical accuracy, accuracy was not likely uh, 
on very high on his priority list. What I think people are doing when they use this 200 mile reference in the reference to the woods is that they're putting their uh, love of math and love of accuracy, which is a very modern conception onto Patrick of the fifth century. And he wouldn't have had that same sense of accuracy that we do now. But the point is that this was a long journey. It was a long journey from captivity to port. And eventually, after some time, after this long 200-mile journey, he came to a port uh, with a ship that was willing to take them on. His, he, quote, refused to suck their nipples, end quote, which is an Irish idiom indicating that he refused to be connected with them. He would, uh, he would go with them, but he wouldn't be yoked with them. He would not be as one of them and yoke himself to pagans. He would board with them as a simple, simple traveler seeking passage home. After landing, Patrick and his traveling companions spent 28 days in the desert. This wandering has baffled many, many scholars. Why was it so long until he found civilization? Why did they run out of food in agricultural society? Where exactly did they wander? Barry theorizes that Patrick and company landed not in Britain, but in Europe on the heels of a Vandal raid, which is why um, and, and, and he theorizes that the Vandals scorched the earth so much that it looked like a literal desert, total devastation. Um, and while there is historical evidence for Vandal activity in Northwestern Europe, uh, this theory is based on way too many assumptions to be considered plausible, I think. Um, but this whole section, is filled with allusions to Israel's experience in the book of Exodus. Uh, let's, let's look at those. Patrick was held captive in a foreign land just as Israel. Patrick in Ireland, Israel in Egypt. Patrick was re rescued over water, him sailing to Britain or, or the continent, if you view it that way, just as the Israelites walked through the Red Sea. Patrick's companions were miraculously saved by a herd of swine, just as the Israelites were saved by quail and manna. Patrick's, Patrick wandered in the desert for 28 days, which is reminiscent of Israel's wandering for 40 years. Patrick himself was tested by God in paragraph 20 just as the Israelites were tested in the wilderness. So we see Patrick setting himself up as kind of this mosaic figure that was uh, later called back to the home of his captivity to be a mosaic figure to them. There's this interesting piece in paragraph 21 that's it's, it's pretty difficult. Um, scholars really don't know what to do with this section um, that speaks of his second captivity. It says, after many years. We don't know really what that means. What exactly was the nature of this captivity? Uh, where does this take place? When exactly did it happen? Is it chronological at this point, or is he inserting something else here? And answers to these questions might never be answered, or might never be known, rather. Uh, personally, I believe this is Patrick's way of showing his readers that he trusted completely in God's word to him. God makes it explicit to Patrick that he's only going to stay in captivity for two months. And instead of it being six years, of the, this is kind of the culmination of his spiritual development, that he trusts in God's word completely and that he's going to um, be patient in this affliction and trust that God is going to rescue him when he says he will. And that's exactly what happens. That's exactly how Patrick describes himself, that he's rescued after two months. Now, finally, uh, Patrick finally makes it home where he receives a son's welcome. He is particularly proud of his family, it's interesting to know. 
Uh, you can hear the affection of, it, of uh, his family that his family has for Patrick and the tone of this entire section. They beg and plead him not to leave them again. At some point during this time, uh, he receives his clerical training. We don't know if that happens in Britain, which is entirely possible, or if he travels to Gaul. In paragraph 42, he makes a reference to the brethren in Gaul. So it is uh, it isn't beyond the realm of possibility that he did his training in Gaul as the Legator hagiographical texts portray. Now, whether in Gaul or in Britain, he is visited by a man named uh, Victorious. Uh, later in the, in the later biographies, uh, Muruku uh, and Tirajan, that man is turned into an angel. This man brings him letters from those in Ireland who are begging him to return and walk among them once more. It is as if he was hearing the voice of the Irish in these letters. And it's through this experience, his heart is moved to return to the land of his captivity, just like Moses, and bring them under the kingdom of God. And it's an interesting side note, as you can see in in the picture, the first Aramel stamps depict an angel flying with Wax Hiberni under his wings, which, which translates to voice of the Irish. And this is a direct reference to Patrick's experience here. So you can see the cultural impact that he's had on the island. Uh, on the island. Paragraphs 42 through 45 are, or I'm sorry, paragraphs 24 and 25 are interesting. Um, Let's, let's read them. In fact, let's go, right, let's, let's read them. Uh, and on another night, neither in me nor close to me, I do not know, God knows. I heard them using the most learned words, but I could not understand them, except what became clear towards the end of the, of the speech. He who gave his life for you, it, he it is who speaks in you. And at that point, I woke up and was full of joy. And on another occasion, I saw him praying in me. And it was as if I was inside my body. And I heard him over me, that is, over the inner man. And he was praying there powerfully with with sighs. And in my excitement and astonishment, I wondered who it could be that was praying in me. But towards the end of the prayer, it became clear that it was the Spirit. Just then, I awoke and remembered what was said through the apostle. Likewise, the Spirit helps the weakness of our prayers. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us in effable signs which cannot be expressed in words. And, it, and again, it says, the Lord is our advocate. He intercedes for us. Within these paragraphs, we get a unique glimpse into the inner spiritual life of Patrick. While he is praying, he acknowledges that he doesn't know the source of his prayers. It is only later that he realized that it was him, uh, that it was the spirit praying uh, inside of him. He understands his deficiencies as a person are made up through the spirit of God. See, unlike Moses, who tried to use his deficiencies to shy away from God's calling. If you remember the Exodus when, in Exodus when God is calling Moses to go back to, uh, back to Egypt, he uses all these excuses. I'm so slow as speech um, uh, and this and that. Um, and then finally he says, God, I don't even want to go. He continually shies away of his calling. Patrick recognizes that it's in his weaknesses that the Spirit as his helper, as his defender, is strong within him and will make up for the deficiencies that are are in him. This is an important feature to the character of and mission of Patrick. His mission didn't come from any human compulsion to make a name for himself. He did not set out to become the patron saint of Ireland His compulsion came from the spirit working in him in such a way that he could not ignore it. He viewed his ministry as fulfilling Jesus' words in Matthew 24, where he says that the kingdom will be preached to the entire word. Remember I said uh, uh, earlier that 
um, Ireland was beyond the realm of the kingdom of God. And so Patrick viewed his ministry as to the very ends of the earth, beyond the kingdom of God, to bring Ireland within the kingdom of God, to bring the kingdom to uh, a place that had never gone before, to the very ends of this, the earth. And his goal was not simply to convert a people, but to sustain, sustain them, to train up clergy, to, to be that uh, mosaic figure. It was to those who had no knowledge of God, whether this means to unreached uh, uh, portions of Ireland. Paragraph 41 seems to indicate that there was no previous mission to at least some parts of Ireland. Um, that doesn't, of course, mean that there was no mission, as, discussed, as we discussed earlier, but that Patrick did come to places what, where people had no knowledge of God. Paragraph 46 is a beautiful example of, of Patrick's reliance on God's uh, mercy for his failings. He sees himself as weak, yet it is the spirit of God that keeps him strong. Other notable uh, features are that uh, he was possibly more popular with the sons of kings than the kings himself. Uh, paragraph 52, um, he was taken captive and looted along with the sons of kings. So it's possible that uh, some of the kings of Ireland, some, some of their sons were actually traveling companions with Patrick. And it appears that he had uh, paid a considerable amount of money in order to move freely within the land. But he continually relies on God's grace and his spirit for perseverance. And this says something about the character of Patrick that he didn't seek to make a name for himself, that he wrote this confessio um, to glorify God, to show others what God has done through his work. Despite his failings, despite his deficiencies, God was still faithful and that uh, nothing can be gained outside of God. Um, he was a very pious man. He knew his weaknesses and relied on God's strength to, uh, to make up for those weaknesses. Um, next time, we will look at Muruku's portrayal of St. Patrick. Uh, this, is, this is a little bit more within my wheelhouse, and so I'm excited to talk with you about that. But um, I hope this was helpful and gives you a better insight on who Patrick was and what his mission and how he saw his mission to the Irish. Thank you for your attention and have a blessed day.